My name is Adil Najm. Uh, I am the director of the Pardi Center for the study of the uh, longer range future. Uh, I am also a professor in international relations and in geography and environment. It's a great pleasure to have all of you here. Uh, this is the first, um, first event in this seminar series. And what we want to do, what we hope to do with this one is about once a month, uh, during both semesters uh, have a seminar like this. And the design is that we want to bring three or four professors uh, from various parts of BU or from people outside BU, but people from different disciplines, people from different perspectives, <laughs> working on similar issues uh, to talk about that issue in a truly interdisciplinary uh, fashion. And I say this uh, for two reasons. A, I think uh, because it is important. Uh, we at the center think that if you look at the great challenges and great problems that are confronting the world today, uh, especially the, uh, the, 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 the big ones, you, s you see that they have two characteristics. One is that most of them are, in fact, long term and long range, and that's the, that's the mandate of the, the center. They are long range not in the sense that they will happen in the future. They are long range in whatever we do today will have a major footprint uh, in the future, and that if we do want to do uh, get to a better end in the future, we'll have to do things about them today. Uh, and that's really what the center is about. We are about analysis of trends, of scenarios, of projections, of issues that are important to human well-being today and into the future. We are not in the prediction business. Uh, but we are in the projection business, and most importantly, we are in the policy business. So that is one aspect of these problems. And the other is, it seems to me, uh, that many of these challenges lie not squarely within a particular discipline, <coughs> but lie at the conjunction uh, of multiple disciplines. Uh, that does not mean the disciplines aren't important. They're extremely critical. But what is also important is that conversation. Uh, between experts in multiple disciplines, and that's what this uh, seminar series uh, plans to address. I'm sorry for the long intro, but I thought since this is the first one, I should do that. Uh, the the, the uh, flyer that I passed around, as I said, is of, uh, for our second event, which will be two weeks from today on the 7th of April right here. Uh, and the topic of the second one is uh, trade and development. And the last plug I want to make uh, for, for this long uh, intro is that I would really encourage people to please suggest other topics. Uh, and suggest speakers, including yourself, uh, who, who, who might be willing to engage in these conversations, uh, of, uh, which, which are longer range, which are interdisciplinary. And conversation is really, really what we want to have today. And we have with us uh, three uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, speakers. Uh, the event today has been co-sponsored by the Global Health Initiative, uh, by the Institute for Economic Development, and by the African Studies Center. And actually, we have someone affiliated to all three. Uh, on our, our, our panel today. Uh, we will be speaking in the order we are sitting, starting with uh, Jerry Kirsch, who heads the Global Health Initiative here at Boston University uh, and is at the medical campus and has a long and illustrious career in international health issues and has some of the most interesting ties that I've ever seen anyone wear. So after you've heard him talk, come and admire his tie. I have been doing that for the last half hour. Uh, <laughs> we, have, uh, we have without a tie, it seems. <laughs> bad show. Bad show there, Jim. No. Uh, we have uh, Jim McCann, who, uh, who I have known for many, many years, and who's one of the most interesting people I know, and who's, done, uh, who's at the Department of History and also at the Africa Study Center, African Studies Center, and works on African history, particularly uh, history from an ecological lens, if, 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 if that's a fair, uh, fair, fair sense. He does so many interesting things that I won't try to list them, but we'll hear from him particularly on his work uh, in, uh, in disease and development, particularly on uh, malaria uh, in, in, and ecosystems in Africa, but anything else that he would also want to talk about. And finally, uh, we have from the Department of Economics, uh, Professor Randy Ellis. And uh, Randy, I just learned, I didn't know this. So you are the new president of the American Society of Healthy Economists. That's right. <laughs> President-elect this time. Of healthy economists. Economists always should be healthy. No, of health <laughs> economists. Uh, of, of health economists. We are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are delighted. We are delighted to have all three of you. Um, I will now um, shut up. 
and give the floor to my three colleagues. And the question is a very simple one. What have, we've asked them to do is to speak very briefly, to set the issue, and then we'll have a conversation amongst all of us here on the question of, as we look forward, as we look at what the world today, what do you think are some of the key <clears throat> challenges in terms of international health and development uh, that face the world today? Uh, that are likely to be facing us in the longer range future, and what are the uh, important challenges and opportunities in that realm. So let me start, uh, without ado, with uh, Professor Kush. Thank you, Adil. Um, first of all, I think it's a great step forward for the Party Center to initiate this kind of a seminar series and to have these, these conversations, which I think will open up some ideas, and, um, and if it works well, uh, new kinds of collaborations uh, among faculty from different parts of the institution, but also our students at the graduate and the undergraduate level, and both campuses. Now, having said something nice, um, let me say that while the title of the um, seminar today is nicely alliterative, it misses the mark, because the issue isn't around disease, it's actually around health. The development side of it is good, because that implies the interdisciplinarity that we need to be thinking about. So um, in, in kind of setting the scene, I think the first thing that we have to keep in mind is the discussion around health as a human right. And if we, if we frame health in those terms, it means that everybody is entitled to um, the, the tools that are necessary to live a healthy life, even, even economists have a healthy, <laughs> healthy economy. Um, and it's, it's really important because it then raises a whole set of, of issues. And I put health at the center in part because I've spent my whole life being a physician. Um, and, uh, but it's the one sector that directly touches on every other sector. So you can't have a, a healthy economy without a healthy population. And lots of reasons for that. And there's actually some data about that with, uh, with economics and economic development. Um, one of the earlier studies was um, a study that Jeff Sachs and colleagues did uh, looking at the rationale or the underpinnings of the Asian miracle, the Asian tigers, the development of the economy. And they could actually put a, a percentage increase on GDP on the increase in child survival in those countries in Asia that went on to economic development. So you had kids healthier, surviving. Um, because they were healthier, cognitive development was better. They were physically more capable. And then there were more of them to enter into the workforce as healthy, healthier, smarter workers. And you can track this to about, if I remember the figures correctly, somewhere about 1% of the increase in GDP experienced by those, com by those countries was related to that single health benefit. So it, 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 it says some things about uh, the importance of health in spheres that we don't ordinarily think about it. And there was a very nice article that John Simon and his colleagues at the Center for International Health and Development, Health and Development, um, <laughs> over, at the, over at the medical campus, um, wrote in 2003 in the Harvard Business Review, which is called AIDS is Your Business. And the premise of that paper was that for businesses to invest in dealing with HIV, both in terms of prevention and treatment, it not only did something good socially, but it was also good for their business. They saved money by investing money. And that had to do with um, the productivity of people on the job. It had to do with absenteeism. It had to do with how much time supervisors had to divert their attention to the problems that were caused by, by ill people. Um, the replacing of workers, particularly when they were trained, you had to find them, you had to train them. That all cost money. You lost experience. Um, and the morale and the disruption of production, all of those sorts of things um, were issues that needed to be dealt with. And, th and that had to do with um, how you deal with a disease and how you promote health and healthy behavior. There's something called um, a demographic transition, which is the transition to older people uh, as a greater proportion of our society. So um, moving from the productive years into the years when you live off of either your earnings or your kids or society. Um, and how do we deal with that? How do we keep people healthier longer to avoid the cost to society of aging and, uh, and, and loss of health? Um, something called the uh, 
um, epidemiological transition, which is the increase in the uh, proportion and importance of non-infectious diseases, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, cancer, um, now affecting the productive populations in society. So all of these things raise issues around the importance of health, basically, not just from birth, um, but uh, from the uh, period of development of, of an embryo and the mother's health in, uh, in dealing with that pregnancy. So it raises the, the issues for us as a rich society of what our role is in dealing with this global issue. Is, remember, this is now very directly connected with all of the themes around globalization. So how do we, how do we deal with it? Do we have responsibility because we're rich to share our wealth? Um, isn't it in our self-interest in order to invest in uh, improving global health? And it's important for us, I think, because when you have healthier, more productive societies in developing countries, you have happier people. And happier people are less likely to become terrorists. Um, that may seem like a stretch to you, but I think when quality of life is improved, um, people's view of the world is improved. If you have nothing to lose, you have nothing to lose to do almost anything to get something. So there's this, uh, this uh, uh, greater context to it. There is a sense as well that knowledge, which is the basis of our current society, um, that knowledge is a global public good. It should be shared and needs to be shared. And when it relates to um, health uh, and, and development, um, how do we do this? Um, how do we make this into a, a real global uh, good? And I think it's one of the things that we need to talk about because ultimately we, we are a university. Our job is the production of knowledge. As a byproduct of that, we try to educate students. Um, but what do we do with that knowledge? How do we use it to, uh, to do something uh, that's good? One of the uh, interesting developments that's occurred over the last decade or so is the um, genesis of new partnerships that involves government on a bilateral, on a multilateral um, level, uh, international organizations, the multilateral organizations, um, the academic sector, and the business sector. And in, uh, in these partnerships for, for health, and uh, they directly touch on development, um, there are several kinds. One is Gates Foundation, for example, s uh, putting money into the development of products, like a vaccine for HIV, or a vaccine or new drugs for tuberculosis, has global, uh, uh, global importance. And it involves the academic, the public sector, and the private sector. But at the same time, um, partnerships to build the capacity to deliver better health care in developing countries. So that now involves policy issues, and it involves dealing with health systems and bridging this uh, gap between what we know and what we actually do and accomplish. There's something that's also, and, and maybe Randy would expound on it at some point during the course of the session, um, of talking about innovation economics. Because I innovation is a key driver of both development and, of course, uh, of improvement of health. Um, so it, it relates to how do we support innovation systems in countries. And the countries that can contribute to innovation are not limited to the first world countries. There's a lot of middle income countries, Brazil, South Africa, India, um, that, uh, that, and Mexico, that have the capacity um, and the people to, um, to, to engage in innovation. But there's also low income countries. I think about places like Mali, which has a fabulous program in insect genetics dealing with vector-borne uh, illnesses. And, uh, and they have something to contribute. So how do we create the opportunities uh, and support these kinds of innovations and networking among them? How do we create more um, user-friendly and, and more sensible policies about intellectual property? Um, how do we create a public sector environment that stimulates investment and, uh, and, and what follows from that? Um, two other comments, and then I'll quit. Um, one is um, the role that rich countries play. And if you look at what happens in, around the world, the agenda is set by the rich countries, 
by and large. So how do we get off of donor the money um, priorities, and how do we get the priorities that are on the ground, the needs perceived by countries around the world? Um, we also tend to use our international assistance as political leverage. And if you just want to see examples of it, just look what the Bush administration has done around the world. Um, no political comments. Um, and then finally, to end up with our thinking about what's the role of this university? What's the role of a university? But more important, what's the role of this university with the extraordinary capabilities that are stretched across the campus among our 30,000 students, among our 17 schools? Um, how do we connect them? How do we make them work together? I think that's, uh, that's the ultimate great challenge, because the only thing I can think of that's more sluggish than governments is a university. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for ending on that happy note. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, I, I think we are, we are all sort of very familiar with, with defining the policy role of governments within countries as being responsible for a healthy society. What you're setting up here is the idea, if I understand it right, that in a globalizing world, maybe there's a global responsibility for global health. And, and as we go forward, hopefully we'll get into a discussion of what, what challenges does that raise? Uh, what does it mean to have health as human rights? And therefore, what does that mean for things from policy uh, related to foreign policy to aid policy, assistance policy, as, as, as you mentioned. But, but those are a number of very interesting issues. Thank you for raising them. Let me move to Jim McCann, uh, who will be, who's from the uh, Center for African Studies and also from the Department of History. Jim. Thank you, Adil. And let me thank the, uh, the parties, Center for its um, inviting this group here. One of the nice things about BU that I've learned as I've worked with other institutions across the country is that we can do things like this rather easily. I mean, it does take initiative to bring people together from this range of disciplines, but I find that ter terrifically exciting. I'm going to take a slightly different approach here, which is that I will take the disease and not challenge the disease focus here. In fact, I'll come back to that. But I will challenge the development um, notion simply in the, in the fact that, that, that as Randy with Ant. <laughs> <laughs> and healthy economists. Yeah. Uh, is development defined as the intention of, of bringing about economic change and the fact that it does often bring about economic change, not always the intended economic change, but unintended consequences. And if that's the context in which I'd like to understand disease is, is a specific <clears throat> manifestation of a health society. Not the only thing. Clearly, there are other th issues involved, as, uh, as Jerry has raised. But I want to say, as a historian, one of the things we bring to bear, if we choose to sort of focus on issues about health and disease and in, uh, ecological change, is that we look over time. We have the skills to look over time at different kinds of evidence, different sources of evidence, and how they play themselves out over the course of the 20th century, a longer time frame, et cetera. And we would see a disease, and I can, I'll give you a list of them. We can all think of diseases that are the focal point for research, for what the Gates Foundation is doing, choosing disease, looking for a specific solution to that, is that historians would see diseases as conjunctural events, events that are a coming together of a whole series of things which are not necessarily understandable as a, as a cause-effect relationship, but ultimately come together, the result being historically a disease. Whether that's the Spanish flu or Rinderpest, a cattle disease critical to the economic uh, health of, of uh, East Africa and Southern Africa, smallpox, malaria, HIV AIDS, um, Ebola, onchocerciasis, leishmaniasis. All of these are diseases with particular kinds of impacts on certain people, certain conditions, but they result from a number of conditions that we can study and try to understand in terms of the relationship and in effect, something like the demographic transition where we have a whole series of things we can't fully understand, but we know here's the result. And when I think about development, um, part of this links back to the project we're working on here at BU and the Harvard School of Public Health on the links between malaria, a well-known disease which is very difficult to manage, and a simple product of development like maize production. What we found is that increasing maize production, particularly in of a certain type uh, that is introduced by development uh, initiatives, that increasing high yield results in a much higher factor 
10 times the, the factor of infection rate of malaria. So I won't dwell on that particular project, but we think about the initiatives of economic development. They're not broadly based. We can see connections possibly cause effect between economic development and health. Uh, sometimes the cause effect is, is difficult to discern over time. But think about the projects. Think about Global 2000. The push of Global 2000 was to say, here's your package of nitrogen and improved seeds, and the result you're going to get is economic growth. That's a very single, uh, single-minded notion of it. The Green Revolution as a whole, add nitrogen, add improved crops, and you get uh, responses to sort of national level food crises. Millennium Project, you have a, a, a bit more in the number of factors involved, but you have a directed focus, which brings about intended and unintended consequences. The, the President's Malaria Initiative, the PMI, a major source of funding for malaria, tends to see things as bed nets. And we were talking earlier about bed net problems in terms of the fact that mosquitoes, Anopheles mosquitoes, are kind of smarter than we are. They adopt, they bite at 6 o'clock. If you put up the bed net at 8 o'clock, they adjust to that very, very quickly. The Gates Rockefeller Fund pushing food production. Those are single-minded, single-solution kinds of initiatives. I would put the vaccines in that, pro that, that uh, category, too. It is the notion that funding one single approach is going to create uh, a set of consequences which are good, but ignoring uh, the complexity of the response, either by the vector or by other factors. So let me just identify some of the key areas where I think we're likely to see conjunctures <coughs> about disease. I've listed some of the key diseases. Some are vector-borne, some are airborne, some are transmitted in a variety of, of, of ways. But think about urbanization. Urbanization is a phenomenon not controlled by any one factor, but it's, that brings demographic change. It brings building, it brings a whole series of economic incentives that create new, ha among other things, create new habitat for vectors. I was sitting in the office of the, the head of the Environmental Protection Agency for Ethiopia uh, last week. And I looked out his window, which is a nice kind of high-rise building overlooking the evolving city of Addis Ababa, and I said to him, I said, Dr. Tawolda, look out your window. You see the transformation of this city. Think of the amount of change in landscape that's creating all kinds of new habitat, all kinds of new configurations of people for transmission of disease. We can't predict necessarily, because we can understand that this urbanization will bring about its own set of, of diseases. Um, cropping change. If Global 2000 and other ones are promoting a, a monoculture cropping change philosophy, which is what they did, that cropping change is going to bring about things we don't, can't quite anticipate now. The maize malaria issue is one of them, but of course there are many others about transmission of crop diseases like, like major rusts, which are threatened to wipe out the entire world, world uh, cultivation of, of wheat. <coughs> in a short period of time, and so we're constantly trying to cha chase down the rusts which only simply reinvent themselves faster than we can respond. Trends of aridity, that's global warming, the winners and losers in terms of who gets the water, but water storage, microdams that create new habitats and new co collections of people. There is some sensitivity to environmental impact changes, but nothing like the level of initiative that goes into funding the projects uh, themselves. Um, that has to do with a whole series of changes in human settlements where people live, where they're likely to be uh, um, uh, acceptable, uh, accessible to disease or to vectors or things of that nature. We can look at these things all over time and learn lessons from, from that. Um, state priorities for productivity. We had a meeting in Ethiopia in which we presented the evidence from the project about maize malaria relationships. The head of the Agricultural Research Institute for Ethiopia was there, and he was fascinated. He was a wonderful participant. He said, this is terrific. Well, it's really, really uh, challenging and, and very worrying. But the one thing you may not do, I may not do, speaking for himself, was I may not change the national priority for food production. Therefore, what you're going to get from us is the highest yielding maize possible, which is exactly the one that, that, that uh, brings tenfold increase in malaria. So our national priority, this is Ethiopia in its history, is food production. You can do a lot of things, but don't tell us to change this central strategy. And then going back to vector habitats, the adaptation of vectors is astonishing. It's a fascinating empirical um, topic. We were talking about the bed nets, if you use them, 
and in something like 2% use the 100% distribution they get from the, the bed net people. Um, the mosquitoes bite at different times. Um, they, their behavior changes very, very quickly. The, the particular vector there has a particular set of characteristics, different than tsetse flies, which tend to be reproduced on the basis of a very different strategy. But we have black flies that we associate with onchocerciasis. We have um, sand fleas we associate with leishmaniasis. There are new diseases emerging, Ebola being one, HIV from an earlier period, but also old diseases that come back and redistribute themselves. And this, these are a result sometimes of economic development strategies that work, but they don't think about health. And so when you see the priorities of governments and international aid, multinationals, what you tend to see also is that single factor, a vaccine for malaria. Which malaria? In which places? And do we assume that either the plasmodium or the uh, mosquitoes are not going to respond quicker, quicker than we can refund a new project? So what I'm suggesting here is that one of the things that BU as an institution and our set of links can do is to bring to bear the agroecology of disease and of health to a point where I think we can begin to make a contribution because of the set of people in this room. It's an amazing, if I just take our project for a moment to illustrate that, if I look around the room I see um, biologists, Horatia would you call yourself a biologist or a entomologist or... Pardon? A developmental biologist. Okay, and you don't mean development in the same sense. No. <laughs> you are developing as a biologist? <laughs> <laughs> that too. That too. <laughs> but healthy. <laughs> and so, so we have entomology, we have economics, we have palynology, we have policy, economics, political science, if you seem. These are people who have either come to BU recently or have been part of a team we've put together. And BU can do this. We've done this for other projects. And it's why it makes it so exciting to be here, because we have visionaries who think about the future. And we also have particular sets of skills that when we walk through an environment, as we do when we're doing our work in Ethiopia, we argue and we debate. And that goes on over the evening over a, the bigger bottle of beer rather than the smaller one, or whether Rich is choosing the wrong fish to eat that evening and uh, is sick for a couple of days. So uh, this teamwork, which is possible here and encouraged by the, the academic culture of Boston University, and add the historian to that, we end up with not necessarily solutions, but understandings that are far beyond the single solution kind of approach. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you also for highlighting the importance of actually bringing these disciplines together. And maybe we can talk when we come to the Q&A also about the problems of having disciplines talk to each other, because it's, it's, it's less easy. Uh, beer helps, I'm sure. But, <laughs> but, but it is still a difficult proposition, and, and how does one make it happen? But what I took from your, your uh, remarks also was that mosquito is smarter than man. <laughs> uh, and, and I say that in a, in a serious fashion. I'm guessing that people in a similar panel in the 1960s, when kids like myself were inhaling DDT, you know, big time, would have thought that in 2008 we would not be talking about malaria anymore. So maybe there's a lesson for the 2038 here about what we might be talking, whether it would still be the old diseases we would be talking about or some of the new diseases, you know, like New Europe and Old Europe uh, that, that, that you brought in uh, and, and what the challenges there might be. And uh, let me pass on to our third and final speaker, uh, Professor uh, Ellis from the Department of Economics. Great, but I can't resist commenting that it's not that the mosquitoes are smarter than us. It's that if you get billions of enough trying different things, one of them will be like a monkey at a typewriter, and they come up with all these re uh, revolutions. But <laughs> anyway, um, I'm delighted to have a chance to think about the longer range future, because most economists don't uh, really address topics like this. So it's quite exciting. So I spend a little time thinking about what are some of the uh, thoughts that I could contribute to uh, this discussion? And I came up with about four of them. So the first one is that actually the good news is that there are more resources being targeted at health problems today than uh, even 10 or 20 years ago. Um, 
And one example of that, which has already been mentioned, is the uh, Gates Foundation, which is currently funding about $900 million a year on health care problems around the world, which is truly an impressive achievement. But it is a very targeted focus, and there, it has changed the nature of health care delivery around the whole globe, in particular uh, by choosing HIV AIDS and polio and uh, uh, certain tuberculosis in particular as targeted uh, diseases, there has been a shift in the international programs f towards program-specific funding rather than broader primary care and public health type activities. And it still remains true that some of the most important things to get developing countries to do is to invest in primary care, public health activities like sanitation, water, uh, and pr 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 protecting the environment. And so the danger is that some countries will be deflected from that more important priority by trying to accommodate these targeted uh, programs. I think a second theme that I see as uh, emerging and continuing uh, through the indefinite future is that as many countries make the transition from very low levels of income and productivity to really quite impressive rates of uh, achievement in China and India and many other countries moving beyond the desperate poor poverty in many cases, there has been a challenge in that you end up with a lot more inequality and inequity in the delivery of care and availability of insurance systems. And I don't think we've really come to grips with how the wealthier cohorts in many of these countries are able to or be willing to bear the burden of helping subsidize and raising the level of health and poverty uh, among the uh, lower uh, groups, which are often remaining uh, well behind, uh, similar to how things have been for um, uh, thousands of years or hundreds of years. And my third uh, theme uh, that I think is uh, a, a particularly big challenge, and we bear responsibility in the, in the U.S. in particular, and that is that um, we uh, happen to invest very heavily in a lot of fancy, very expensive technologies, especially pharmaceuticals, but not only there. A lot of new in, uh, test equipment, a lot of new invasive uh, artificial limbs, artificial organs. These kind of things are wonderful if you have the luxury of the standard of living that we have. But those technologies don't transfer well to low and middle income countries. And so the, it creates a problem for these countries in that the wealthy and the middle income folks in those countries see what's possible in the West and they want it too. And yet no health system in, in a low or middle income country can afford the level of technologies and expense. And that's particularly true for certain pharmaceutical drugs that have been developed like the HIV drugs, HIV AIDS drugs, <coughs> which are often in the thousands of dollars and has been a real challenge to get the pharmaceutical companies and other developers to push down prices or be willing to keep their pricing at an affordable level. And we bear responsibility for helping put pressure on those international companies to uh, make that achievable. The fourth topic is really one that should be a whole session, so I'm actually not going to say very much, and that is, of course, one of the biggest challenges facing the whole globe is the impact of all of our activity on health and standards of living. We all know air pollution, water pollution, chemical poisoning in food systems. Many different problems are caused by our own levels of activities. And I think that that is uh, a growing problem, especially in low-income countries, because they do not yet have the resources necessarily to monitor and avoid some of the mistakes which were made abundantly in the U.S. over the last hundreds of years, and we are still cleaning up now. And there's a challenge for figuring out how we can help inform those other countries to avoid some of those uh, problems. So I'll uh, end there with just some topics that are going to be challenges for the future. Obviously, I'm not offering solutions, but I'm at least raising them as uh, the long-range future problems. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Let me first see if there are any sort of responses from the panel to anything that the others have said. Uh, please. Pick up on, on Randy's last um, Can you comment, Mike? Yeah. Um, having to, to do with Prosperity, the impacts of prosperity. Mm -hmm. Just an example um, is that prosperity in our own maize malaria project, people create habitat when they build their new house. They dig the clay that creates the ideal habitat for the, Anoph the Anopheles arabiensis mosquito. And that's a response to the fact they're making an awful lot of money from growing hybrid crops. Another example is that in increasing urban prosperity 
brings increasing livestock consumption, which brings about pressure on pr prices for par farmers to plant livestock feed. And the last bit of that is that the fattening process used in the U.S., use of DES and uh, bovine growth hormones, which are now, many of which are now illegal in the U.S., are still legal to export. So when you see a place like Addis Ababa I know well or Harare before things collapsed, they were increasingly putting pressure on people to fatten their livestock. Poultry needed to have yellow egg yolks, not white egg yolks. All of these things of prosperity created the incentives for farmers to begin to import the kinds of agrochemical uh, inputs that made them money, but in the long run, our, our own um, departments of health decided were very dangerous for the population. So DES and things like that, that cause birth defects, like thalidomide, uh, that whole generation are now illegal in the U.S., but still legal for, for us to export elsewhere in the world. Prosperity has its own set of consequences. Yeah. Let, me, let me open it up. Uh, we have a mic there, and if you raise your hand, uh, Lindsay will, will bring the mic to you. I don't think we have space here for people to move around, but, uh, but please raise your hand and I'll recognize you and she'll bring the mic. One of the thoughts that did strike me, uh, especially when Randy was mentioning his, his uh, fourth point, is, uh, is, is climate change, which uh, I think you mentioned briefly. Uh, which again becomes not necessarily a source of new disease, but of the changing ecosystems of old disease. So mosquitoes in Italy, you know, wine, pasta, and mosquito, uh, uh, and sort of the mobility of, of, of disease that way. And then also the issues of globalization and the mobility that it provides not only to people but but to disease and how how that uh, how that affects the whole whole uh, equation my my sort of uh, one of the big things i seem to take from this is i am actually struck by how much all three of you are still talking about the issues that we would have talked about 20 uh, years or so ago uh, and so in some ways in a planet which has in fact become more healthy in the sense that people live longer eat better uh, we have uh, both the existing challenges of disease with us uh, and an emerging new set of challenges to disease. And the question, therefore, is what do we do about them and, and what are the best ways to tackle these? Uh, any, any comments, uh, Pablo? Thank you. Uh, my name is Pablo Suarez. I'm here with the Department of Geography. I'm also affiliated with the Red Cross internationally, Oxfam, and other humanitarian organizations. And thinking of this issue of the longer range future, we mentioned uh, government and academia as low changing entities, but the humanitarian uh, sector is also very slow at adapting to change because too often, like now, the, the response is about the shock that has already happened. So what Ariel just raised, uh, chikungunya disease uh, breaking up in Mauritius, uh, malaria going to new places, water scarcity leading to a lot of stuff. The Red Cross has about 100 million people, including uh, staff and volunteers, only two, and I'm one of them, with any training in climate research. So if climate change is changing the nature of humanitarian organizations' work, how can we help from knowledge centers like BU, how can we help the humanitarian sector to think about what's coming in terms of health and development and to shape their power, their capacity to mobilize resources and, and people? Uh, we are uh, starting a project along this future of humanitarian organizations here at the party center. So if anyone has, like some of the ideas that were raised today, uh, I haven't begun to think about it. Urbanization, uh, demographics, people getting older, that has very severe impacts for, for humanitarian uh, groups. So anyone who has thoughts about that, please, uh, sorry to be selfish, but uh, do come and give me your card and I'll chase you up later. Question for the speakers is, what do you think as priorities for Red Cross, Oxfam and others in terms of what should be done now, or at least thought about now, so that when the future materializes with all these scary things, we're better prepared. Thank you. Uh, I think you raise an important um, issue in and in a sector that's um, very much involved in, in trying to address problems as they arise. Um, but in, in part, the, um, the criticism of the humanitarian sector is what you said. It's, 
it's coming in with the with a band-aid to address a, a situation that's occurred with external resources and while there are better and worse organizations doing that um, their systematic investment in local development and local participation leaves something wanting and, uh, and so as you address the um, the role and place of, of the humanitarian organizations, uh, they have to learn how to connect with the, the development side of things. And, uh, and, and it sort of made me think about um, our role and responsibility as a university. Um, what we traditionally do is to learn more and more about less and less. And uh, so the whole basis of, of science has been reductionist. And we're not trained to think peripherally. And uh, until we, as academics, begin to think per peripherally and instead of reductionist, being integrative, um, we're not going to be able to connect with the humanitarian sector. Um, so th this learning experience, I think, needs to be um, something that we're very conscious of and that we identify interfaces internally, as we're trying to do across the university and both campuses and different schools and departments, but also outside of the university. How do we interface with these, these multiple sectors and through that addressing policy, creating knowledge, um, creating an environment in which the knowledge can be used, addressing some of the economic issues that, that Randy raised about access. Um, there's this whole set of issues and we can only do it when we think as a whole, as a university, not as a school or a department or a laboratory or a research project. Okay. Anyone else? Right up here. Um, my question's for Dr. Jerry. Um, you raised a very valid point about the agenda being set by rich countries um, and, and not by the countries that are particularly in need. And um, I'm just curious, and, and all three of you can add on to it, it's like how, how can we go about bringing a change in that? Is there institutions that are trying to create a change in, so that the agenda is set by more, more people in need and not by what a, what a government wants to do or what um, an international organization wants to do? Before you answer that, can I add to the question and open it up for everyone also? Uh, we'll start. And repeat the question. Yeah. So the question question was that Jerry had mentioned that the agenda is set by the rich countries, by the donor countries, is donor driven, and and not recipient driven. And and what you asked was how can we change that? And I wanted to add to that, how would the agenda be different if it were set by the by the recipient countries? What do you think would be different if in fact that could happen? So I'll address the general and let <laughs> Jim and Randy address the more specific. Um, I think the catchphrase is um, capacity development uh, as a part of everything that we do. And, and the, uh, the other side of capacity development is colonialism. And we certainly have had lots of colonial um, programs uh, over, over time in history and, and still existing to the present day. And, uh, and it speaks to the fact that um, that knowledge and contributions uh, don't come solely from the rich countries. They come from everywhere. And uh, you have to be open to that potential and to create an environment in which there's a set of mutual goals. Um, and it can be done. And increasingly, the organizations that are supporting collaborations are interested in, in supporting this mutualism approach and a capacity building. We don't lose by it. We actually gain. We learn things <laughs> that are really important. I think Rand Randy or somebody mentioned the, the issue of the, of the high-cost prosthetics. Um, there, are, there are places around the world that are developing materials and, and, and prosthetics that are cheap and functional and really work. Um, why do we have to always do things that are highly expensive? Why can't we do them more cheaply and as effectively? We stand to learn a lot. It would have a lot to do with improvement in our economy as well. If I can comment on these last two questions, uh, partly this has to do with uh, whether it is a program targeted from outside uh, or humanitarian aid kind of activity or an infrastructure building from within kind of 
of activity. And <coughs> I'm a big fan of Oxfam and the Red Cross, uh, but humanitarian aid uh, uh, does tend to go after problems after they've already become critical in crisis uh, nature, which doesn't help countries necessarily avoid them reoccurring. And um, one of the example that uh, some people are making an initiative to do, I'm not involved in this at all, but uh, and I may even have the wrong acronym, but there's a group I believe is called 2015.org. Isn't that the right name? Anyway, their goal is to have these international programs designate some proportion, like 15 percent, of their total to supporting infrastructure and primary care and other activities within the recipient country um, as a way of helping them maintain all of these other important uh, public health or other types of, of missions. One of the challenges as an economist in, in international donors trying to influence countries to uh, build more uh, sanitation or do primary care is that money is very fundable so it doesn't necessarily increase a country's uh, activity in that area. They will just take that uh, contribution and then uh, reduce their own funding and spend it somewhere else. So uh, I do think it's particularly challenging to get countries to do this but there are some successful organizations that have tried to decentralize and get uh, some of these activities uh, to work. Can I add that I, th I think that um, your point about the $900 million provided for international health, I mean, that, that is a, wonder a wonderful contribution in a, in a macro sense, but there's om it only goes to infrastructure very indirectly. A lot of that goes for income generation by, by local folks who are otherwise very dedicated, but income generation is important to, to getting by with your life. Um, as inflation sort of goes crazy in places like Zimbabwe. So, so, so when you say infrastructure or income generation, you mean health-related no, or general? I'm saying that the money that's going for targeted projects, much of that is really about in, having workshops and income generation, whereas the infrastructure directly tied to the building of health centers, the provision of key uh, materials for people to use, I think would be the key. But, but NGOs have a tough time doing that because they're donor-driven, and their donors are either the public or USAID saying, we will give you money for bed nets, but not money for, um, for microscope for, for your laboratory to right. proper, properly to diagnose a particular disease. So, so just to push you on that, are you saying that if it was not donor driven, you will have more laboratory uh, investment as opposed to bed nets? So I'm, I'm trying to get back to this, this notion of what might, how, how might the world look different if we could actually get Jerry a world where it is not donor driven. Where Ethiopia does actually have a say in how that 900 million is spent. Uh, what can we tell Bill Gates about how it should be spent differently? Well, I guess this gets back to the original question and, and, and quickly would be that what Ox I didn't necessarily agree when Oxfam America shifted its focus to education of the American public and advocacy. But I think this is a case where if they were to convince a general public's notion of what is worth doing, that would filter up to the or trickle up to the gates, and they'd say, "Okay, bed nets were fine, but we need to do something about building local health centers with a with a given set of materials to work with, and some training also, human infrastructure." But Gates Gates Foundation, as an example, has actually not been interested in capacity building. Um, they've been very product development oriented. Mm -hmm. They've not invested in leadership. They've not invested in primary care. Um, their um, their take on the world is a very skewed one. And uh, there are a number of us who have been trying to push the foundation to move towards a more development, broader um, writ uh, perspective than they have taken up to now. Uh, it's, it's also interesting, just as, as an aside, that um, the, uh, the personality of these organizations um, and their, uh, their psychiatric uh, uh, diagnosis and behavior, um, Rockefeller Foundation has a long history of investment in public health programs, going back to um, the, the foundation of the foundation um, to tackle hookworm disease in the United States. Um, as the Gates Foundation came up and started to spend more and more money, and Rockefeller transitioned from one president to another, it took them two and a half years to decide they wanted to continue to have a health program. Because they said, we can't make our reputation by investing in something that the Gates can buy us out of almost immediately. And they didn't see where they would have any leverage to do their kind of thing. 
and uh, and so this mon it, Bill Gates does this very well. He did this with Microsoft. He creates a monopoly, where and and particularly now with the Warren Buffett money, there's nobody, not even the National Institutes of Health of the United States, who can effectively compete with the Gates Foundation in this particular field. No, but just, just a minute. So, so the problem was that we didn't have enough money, and now the problem is we have too much money. It's how it's being invested. No, it's not too much, but um, it's this behavior of organizations. You know, I think if you, if you tackle at the Party Center, if you tackle the humanitarian organizations, I, I think you have to tackle the foundation world and where they're investing and why and how. So the institutional dimension is critical, Robert. Yeah, I, I was, I? Oh, yeah. The, the microphone oddly does nothing to sound in this room. Yeah, it it, it only helps on the recording. So Robert, this is for posterity. <laughs> As my students know, I have a loud, obnoxious voice. So it never seems to have trouble going. I, I was just going to ask you, to what extent are the problems you were just asking related to the uh, little thing by David Brooks in the New York Times about this whole idea that... Um, or institutions should now act more like the private sector, should be run like the private sector, you know, these charitable organizations. Is that what's creating the problems you're talking about? Jay? Um, I, I, I see the issue with, with some of the organizations that I know um, as uh, too little vision and too much ego. Um, so it's part of the, you know, the, the, the integrative building up of, uh, of understanding how um, A connects to B to C to D and, 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 their, and their role um, in this connected kind of, of a universe. Um, the, the business model um, for, uh, for behavior in science is certainly part of the Gates Grand Challenges program. That's a f I don't know if people are familiar with it, but Gates Foundation invested $450 million to fund 43 projects over a period of five years that are designed, the projects are designed to um, break a problem through innovative uh, research. Um, and, uh, and, and the way they run this is just like industry. It's milestone driven. You have to get from A to B in a certain period of time. It's totally unlike the way we deal with science in a university or our thinking process. And um, we won't know if it's worked until the end of the grand challenges if something actually comes out of it. Uh, so I, I think there's a multiplicity of models that need to be used. Uh, we shouldn't be stuck with, with one or another. So call, call for Devers, do you think? Um, on this issue of technology, I do think that uh, many of my colleagues and other economists in developing countries are very excited by the microfinance approach and decentralizing some of this rather than top down, this is how we solve the problem, helping educate women and giving relatively small liquidity to small businesses turns out to have a huge uh, impact on development and health. Uh, and it's sometimes surprising that building roads or schools can be a more effective health investment in some ways than just trying to uh, build a new hospital. You know? And that's part of the challenges of you know, these different dimensions of development. So I, I know we have another question, but it reminds me what both of you said. Back in the 70s and 80s, the population crowd used to say uh, development is the best contraceptive. Right? And it, it, there, there was a lot of logic to it, that if you do development right, if people become more affluent, all the other stuff will start happening by itself, that people will start having <coughs> smaller families and so on and so forth. Are you saying, is this panel saying that development is the best health policy? I didn't say that. I, I, <laughs> I, that's one of the, that's originally my understanding of that argument about development brings about changes in population growth, rising age of first marriage, things like that, is that there was a historical argument. I was looking at Western Europe and saying, in Western Europe when we had economic change, we gradually got a whole series of conjunctural factors that resulted in better health. We, don't, we can't identify any particular one, but it was overall economic development as seen in that case. And sometimes that does work. When you have conditions where age of marriage <coughs> begins to go up, population rates begin to go down, but it's not been fully proven because that one model was originally historically driven. If I had to respond to that, I'd say that, um, tongue-in-cheek, 
that the best thing we could do is what we're doing, which is continue to increase the cost of education, because then families will say, we can't have too many kids if we want to educate them. Um, <laughs> On the, other, on the other hand, um, not tongue-in-cheek, um, there's lots of data that suggests that reductions in infant mortality are followed with a lag period of about 10 to 15 years in a reduction in births. And it goes to traditional societies, uh, so it's not just um, Western um, society in the, in the industrialized world, um, that people's insurance is in their kids. And when they know their kids are going to survive, they have fewer of them, and it has economic and health benefits associated with it. So the development health um, intersect is clearly two arrows going in, in opposite directions and linking with one another. So it's not one or the other. Well, they, they, are, they are the same. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, I understand that infrastructure is something that we're concerned about and we're worried about how much money there is available to build infrastructure. But I think um, an important problem that I've seen in studying development has been that even in countries where infrastructure does exist and hospitals do exist, a, a huge problem is service delivery and how to ensure that health providers actually show up to work or that enough medicine is available to treat work uh, patients and so on seems to be an important problem. And I was wondering what your... Um, thinking was on how that could be improved. You better repeat it. Uh, people got the question, so whoever answers I mean, can think. Yeah. Of, I think yeah. the back does it. The, uh, the issue was that um, there, uh, there is evidence that in some countries, even when they have infrastructure of hospitals and providers, then there may still be problems of lack of delivery of care, lack of incentives facing uh, uh, hospitals and doctors, and I'm very much aware of that, and I agree with that uh, perception. I think that uh, part of it all comes down to incentives uh, as an economist, that sometimes uh, health systems uh, may create hospitals and ambulances but don't fund them with electricity or supplies or very simple things that make them work, but also uh, many of the personnel lack the right incentives to want to put into effort, put in effort, and and uh, provide uh, the kinds of services that are possible. And that is a challenge both in developed countries and developing countries. Uh, and the striking thing is you can often have incredibly inefficient systems even at the same time that they're woefully uh, low in uh, you know, availability. You know, that, that just because you build a hospital doesn't mean it will be efficient because it's the only thing around. So, As a, as a physician, I can tell you categorically that the last place you want to be when you're sick is a hospital. Um, and, and the issue, I think, is um, taking it from there, is that we have failed to invest in prevention. Our, our society, our health system, is all geared to the high-end cost of treatment and, and curative treatment. Um, we have a poor public health infrastructure. It hasn't gotten any better over the last um, 10 or 20 years. While the amount that we invest, the percentage of GDP and the total amount of dollars that we invest in our healthcare system has increased, we do less well than Kerala State in India with, or Cuba with respect to infant mortality. So there's something wrong in the way we've organized it, which means that we are a paradigm of how not to do it. And that's an important lesson. We cannot simply export what's developed in this country um, to other parts of the world because it's all backwards, it's all wrong. Um, I just had a follow-up question on some of the things that you are saying about local governance. You know, participation by the public, which you sort of pointed out, is important. But more importantly, I think governance at the local level is leading to a lot of regional disparities. And I'm glad you pointed out the state of Kerala, which is somewhat more developed than all of its neighbors. And it's much to do with how the local governance sort of showed the interest and the care to educate people, to educate women, and so on. Uh, that was one comment, you know, that the governance seems to be very important. And people talked about participation, but not governance and the local bodies that sort of are needed to mandate health at local levels. The second question I had, uh, being at BU, is um, in all our classes, we sort of drive at you know, the theory, the delivery of healthcare, and all these other things. But somehow, the implementation aspect of it and how things sort of actually happen on the ground is lacking. We actually need field courses where we expose our students for healthcare in the 21st century. 
some of the things that you're saying. I mean, uh, courses or seminars like this are very useful because we don't teach this in the class. We are very satisfied with the theories, with the models, with everything that we do in the normal run of things. And I wish there was more of an emphasis on practice because I think that's what we need to give to the students at this point. I think you make some very important points. Um, <laughs> And the issue of, of governance, the way this country seems to respond to governance is all around corruption um, and, and transparency and nothing about vision. So Kerala is a great example because um, there was a good governance, but also a vision. Think about um, a United States where there's 100% literacy. You know, we are so rich and we are so far from 100% literacy, which Kerala has achieved. And the education has really paid off, in, even though they continue to have an economy that's a fraction of what ours is, their health um, indicators are so much better than ours. Professor Snott? <coughs> My name is Hasnat. I'm in the geography department, and incidentally, I'm also a student of Randy. <laughs> okay, and my comment is actually on Randy's, Randy's idea. And my, I would like to add that it is not just the availability of infrastructure per se, but along with infrastructure development, the decentralization of function at the sub-regional level. I can give a concrete example. After the recent flood in Bangladesh, there is a huge incidence of cholera. But the statistics show that the victims, those who are close to Dhaka, that is the capital of the Sikh country, and where there is a huge, I mean, cholera research laboratory funded by USAID and all these things, the rate of death was much lower than the people who suffered in the periphery, simply because there is no infrastructure. So part of your infrastructure comment, and my humble add to that, that even Muhammad does not come to, I mean, mountain, then mountain can go to Muhammad, right? right? That means the whole cultural research laboratory, not the full paraphernalia of research, but simply salt and, you know, water can reach to the local level in a small hospital mm -hmm. so that the patient don't have to come to Dhaka, but they can get the treatment. So it's a decentralization of function along with the infrastructure connection. Thank you. Can you take a question there? Oh, yeah. um, Ashley Stevens from the School of Management and the Office of Technology Development. Um, I want to introduce a new theme into the debate because uh, we've been talking consistently about donors and recipients and the issue of, you know, uh, what would the recipients want and so forth. Um, I was very struck by a article in the Wall Street Journal a, a couple of months ago uh, anticipating Bill Gates' speech to the Davos World Economic Forum and I was a little disappointed the journal didn't then um, publish his speech or any details, but I went and found it. And, and Gates is saying, okay, um, we, we need to move on, and um, philanthropy has its limits, it's not sustainable, and we need to start to get the private sector addressing this. And first of all, I want to recommend everybody in this room to get the book, The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, and read it. Alas, our namesake library, the Pardee Library, does not have a copy. The Boston Public Library has one copy, and the entire Minuteman library system has two copies. But uh, work hard and get it. It, is, it will change your thinking. I thought Jerry was going there when he talked about prosthetics. They talk about the Jaipur foot, uh, which has been developed in India, is not approved for sale in the US, but uh, an amputee usually somebody from the desperately poor and who can't work because they have um, a missing lower limb, can get fitted for about, I think it's 50 bucks. Um, they talk about cataract surgery, uh, where they have uh, the Aravind uh, Eye Foundation uh, has created um, centers for uh, uh, cataract surgery that have complication rates that are better than those of the British National Health Service and where you can have your sight restored for about 200 bucks. Uh, and it gets into microfinance, which uh, Randy mentioned and so forth. And it is a, a mind-changing book and I do strongly recommend that to people. But let me ask the panel to talk about, okay, how can the private sector start to make a contribution as well as the philanthropic sector and the public sector. 
Thank you. Thank you for that very useful intervention. We have a bunch of other questions, but I also wanted to open that and maybe throw in the issue of uh, intellectual property rights in that also. But what is the role of the private sector? Just as a plug, I should say that in our seminar two weeks from now, uh, Professor Sushil Vichani would be actually one of the speakers and will be speaking, I assume, at least partly about the bottom of the pyramid yeah. and the multiple fortunes uh, to be made or not to be made that uh, Prahalad talks about in the book that you mentioned. But what is the role of the private sector, both in the large private sector and what you were mentioning, the smaller indigenous private sector, uh, in, in, in making the great health transition if one is to be made? Anyone? Randy? Well, um, uh, often when people talk about intellectual property, they're thinking patents. And I just mentioned patents are a big factor driving innovation, and they last only 17 years. And the good news is that all these great drugs that get developed eventually do drop down to close to production costs. It may take quite a long time. So that, that's the one positive. Uh, it's also true that because of insurance, the type of technology that gets invested in, in the, for the U.S. is the extremely expensive cost increasing uh, with modest quality improvements. And what is often available if you can invest in it in developing countries is the cost saving or low cost technique. And the problem is that there's not a lot of money in that, so there tends to be underinvestment of that. Uh, there have been uh, some charitable organizations that have invested in like the river blindness uh, drugs and things that have been successful at trying to develop uh, alternative low cost. I mean, the exciting ideas of this foot or the wheelchairs that have been developed that using very low cost materials. These are exciting, but they need to be developed sort of organically within those countries or in the lower income spectrum because it isn't likely that the uh, U.S. Uh, big mega industry is going to look at that as a profitable activity. So again, I think pushing back activities to try and have it being developed in the settings where it will be used is a very uh, a promising possibility. But it would have to, you know, the governments typically aren't the best innovators. Uh, so it is a challenge to find the private sector that can do this kind of activity. I, uh, I think the, um, you'd have to, you have to categorize the role of the private sector as essential. Um, and picking up on, on your last comment, neither government nor academia can actually deliver. Um, they, they have their own particular um, contribution to make, uh, but um, it's, it's not going to work without um, a, a, a private sector component to it. And the, now, the issue is, how do you get the private sector to realize that they have something to gain and, and not to look at... Um, uh, this as th they're going to lose out. And, uh, and you do that by partnering and not demonizing. And I think part of the problem that we have experienced, and I'll just think about the pharmaceutical industry, uh, is that um, they have been demonized by the advocacy groups. Now, some of it is justifiable. Not all of it is. But they're an essential part of the puzzle. You don't get uh, people or groups or organizations to contribute if you continually bash them. You get them to the table to discuss, and then they actually can behave more reasonably, particularly um, if there are no corporate lawyers in the room. Because they understand what the issues are, and they're much more willing to take the steps um, when they can partner. Uh, and so there are a lot of, of uh, techniques that have now been, or strategies that have now been developed of how you, in, in the pharmaceutical industry and the, the medical devices, how you entice them to participate through public funding and creating public-private partnerships is we shouldn't have a system in which what, what comes out of it is the ability to, to buy marginally better health at a big cost. We should be able to, um, to partner in such a way that the advances are significant, that they become available to all, that we have some kind of a socialist perspective, that it's according to ability to pay. There's no sense to me that Canada can buy drugs at a fraction of the cost when their economy is better than ours now. Um, and this is simply because of this failure of government to partner with industry in, uh, in, 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 uh, in purchasing and setting prices. Yeah, I'll just um, kind of pose the example within my field of experience, which is actually related more now to the drug industry than it used to be, which is agricultural development um, of new crops and seeds. That they're, Now most of the, cr of the crop development agencies um, are owned by 
by chemical companies, by drug companies. And their response has been they will not invest in new materials for smallholder farmers, which we have in the Indian subcontinent and in Africa, because the profitability is in selling, in this case, hybrid seeds that have to be re renewed every year. And it's been a problem. I've not seen a solution there. Clearly, they have te technical expertise, but their incentives are driven in this sort of classic way by can we sell this in large amounts and have a rec rec recurrent um, incomes from that. And so it's not, right now that's not working. You have private organizations, you know, international organizations that are investing in new crop varieties. They're sensitive, but they're very small. That there has to be some role, but we've not seen it in the agricultural side, I would argue. And, and this raises the question, and maybe this is for, we'll just come to you, sir, if we can pass the mic there. Um, maybe they, we'll, we'll come back to this question two weeks from now when, when Sushil Vichani talks about this, that especially in the health domain, can the big behemoths, the large multinational companies, are they best placed to operate at the bottom of the pyramid, particularly in something like health? Uh, or, or do we also then think of a different type of, you know, not just the Pfizer's, but the Dr. Reddy's and the Cipla's, uh, which, which have been more, more nimble in, in, in figuring out some of the realities of the environments they work in, uh, and, and, and what does that mean for health. But we will come back to that. Uh, gentleman behind you, and then you back, sir. Um, yes, I'd, I'd like to bring up an, an incident uh, or an occurrence that illustrates the lack of partnership can thwart even the best um, intentions of, in this case, the pharmaceutical industry. In the case of onchocerciasis and trachoma, you have two major drug companies, Pfizer and Merck, that have essentially offered a, an effective uh, control against those two diseases. And yet, despite they have unlimited amounts available, it is not utilized and onco is reoccurring and trachoma is not moving down as fast as it should simply because they have no partnerships who trust them to the point who will build the infrastructure and the means to deliver those drugs. So they essentially sit on the shelves not being made and not being distributed and not uh, taking care of either trachoma or onchocerciasis because there's no one who will join them in a partnership, I think because some of the pharma bashing that goes on. And therefore, there's, there's diseases not being controlled for where a good amount of the resource is being made available by the private sector. Can I just say something about the issue with, on with onchocerciasis as with schistosomiasis not having a drug? That doesn't solve the agroecological problem of who goes near the black flies by the river for economic reasons, reasons that, that people derive from their livelihoods. Having a drug that you give for schistosomiasis to people out, keep people out of irrigation canals does not change the economic needs they, they, they have or the needs for the fact that young kids swim in the water because it's, uh, it's 40 degrees you know, Celsius. So I think the drug issue is one that's only a part of it, though. I mean, the fact that if you can cure it, then what do you do about the larger context? And that's where I would argue that the sort of agroecology approach helps you understand more fully to where maybe the partnership doesn't be begin to make sense. I'm, I'm not an expert on those two drugs, but I know that a chronic problem with new drugs is they often require refrigeration. And refrigeration is extraordinarily hard to get into some of these rural areas. And that, that is a source of failure of some of the drugs that are developed, that they require relatively rapid uh, distribution. And that's partly tied into whether this is a program specific or part of the broader reinforcing the structure of health clinics and provision in these rural areas. Hi, I, I know we're running over, but I, I just thought I'd, uh, Jerry's touched on almost everybody's mentioned it is the importance of education and uh, and information dissemination. And I work. My name is Jamil Simon. I work in development communications, and I've developed uh, programs, uh, public awareness programs in 20 countries around the country, around the world. And and basically, I think that you know what, what Jerry was saying was that that big uh, donors like say Gates are investing in uh, in healthcare or say malaria without and distributing nets but not the information that should go with it and um, and very little is invested in information dis dissemination on the part of almost all the donor groups I mean and uh, you know I think that the way I the metaphor that I use for what we do in the field of dis development communication is like having a party 
and decorating the house and uh, you know inviting uh, musicians and f buying the food and hiring the caterer but forgetting to issue invitations I mean to some extent the uh, so many donor groups are failing and it's just simply not in the RFPs it's not in the uh, the funding that's going to so many projects they'll put money into reform without m investing in the information dissemination that's required to develop buy-in and that that include is in truth in health and it's in truth in um, agriculture and uh, many many fields and I think it's a real problem I mean, really have to see the, the communication piece of it as an essential component and and part of the problem is as you point out that there's too little investment in that it's like um, research agencies funding a project but failing to fund the data analysis that comes after you've collected the data. Um, and we, in, in the scientific community, we don't know how to talk to anybody other than our, our colleagues. We use jargon. Um, we don't use plain language. We have a very hard time talking to the public. Um, we get concerned when we talk to the media because we're going to get put into a corner because the media is all about sensationalism and we're going to get shot down. Uh, we don't know how to talk to politicians because we inherently don't like them. We, we just have no skills and nobody teaches the skill sets that are necessary to communicate more broadly. Nor does an academic think it's necessarily his or her job to go out and talk to the press or to go out and, and talk in the community and talk to the public. So it's the, it's the changing of our own attitudes and, and in, an, in an institution, a university, we ought to make it mandatory for promotion of the academic ladder in addition to the papers that you've published and the effectiveness of your teaching in the classroom. So being on Geraldo is necessary for <laughs> getting tenure. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> and only then will the behavior change if there's a reward attached. Yeah. Yeah, but, but there's an important message here. We don't talk enough to each other, and we don't talk enough to the outside world, not just the press, but oh, the policy policymaker even. We use the same language and words, but mean entirely different things. Yeah. We'll take a couple of more questions, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, I think uh, the first thing is uh, looking health as uh, part of a development. And in earlier times, uh, Health was the last agenda, a policy agenda in many countries. And policymakers were sensitive when they are, you know, uh, told in terms of economic terms. And uh, these days the agenda is, you know, changing. This attitude is changing. I think this, this is the major obstacle that has been uh, uh, going on for years. Having said this, Decentralization of services are being encouraged in many developing countries, and which is also true. Uh, one of the issues here is when you decentralize services, there is a need to develop capacity, which requires human resource capacity and at the same time provision of you know health commodities. We, 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 that some of them are expensive, some of them are easily available around there. Including. I think these are the basic issues where that needs uh, enforcement and even even people who have uh, drugs, uh, who have, uh, uh, they don't like it, uh, having, having available around there. So I think one of the major issues that also requires cross-discipline uh, 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 collaboration is the area where how how things and uh, this decentralized service system is a basic issue. The second thing is how the academy or the research team develop simple tools that can be easily adopted by the lower professional levels uh, uh, and that to enable them to tackle those problems is the issue. Uh, and it's, People down working around the community can't really use these sophisticated models or tools. And developing these simple tools requires you know, uh, the academic, you know, new research to do it with these problems 
and uh, intersectoral collaboration between different institutes. And how how do you look about this? I think this also goes back to some of the comments made earlier by Suchi and other on implementation. And, and it, it seems from a lot of what you are, all are also saying that a lot of the problem is not just that we don't have enough <coughs> money or we don't have enough knowledge. It's also that we haven't thought seriously about applying the money and the knowledge in a way that will make, uh, make, make a difference. Uh, I'll take one last question and then come back to the panel with... Uh, Jen Sir, you had a question to follow up? Sure. <coughs> I'm never at a loss for questions or comments. <laughs> uh, you, asked, you, you made a comment uh, or asked a question recently. Are the big pharmaceutical companies uh, the best ones to address the issues of health in the developing world? Uh, and I think their answer themselves is coming increasingly to be no. And it's kind of interesting that they're starting to act more like universities. And we've seen Novartis set up first the Institute for Tropical Disease Research as a not-for-profit in Singapore. And then just a couple of weeks ago, they announced the second of their not-for-profit research institutes for vaccines uh, in Siena, Italy. Uh, and Glaxo um, you know, has done the same thing in Spain. And they seem to be you know, implementing what I've seen characterized as a no-profit but no-loss model doing what they're good at, discovery, and then involving uh, the public-private partnerships that Jerry talked about, who do work with the very low-cost generic producers like Simply and Ready and Rambaxi and uh, Aspen and so forth, uh, and have the connections uh, in the country to be able to test these, diseases, uh, these drugs in the, sort of, in the countries where they're actually going to uh, be used. So I, you know, we, we, I think there's definitely a new, a new model uh, of pharmaceuticals emerging. Thank you. Thank you. I will uh, thank you for that comment and, and, and very useful. Let me ask one last uh, question by way of also giving you uh, the, the opportunity for any last remarks or anything else you want to tie in. You know, I mean, in some ways, this is the obvious party center question. Uh, so since the mosquito is the metaphor of the day, what will it take in the next 35 years to deal with malaria? Well, first of all, do you think we'll still be talking about malaria in 35 years if we meet again? And what might it take from your experience? What would we need to do different between now and then so that we are not talking about it or talking about it less? If, if history is our guide, um, we'll be talking about malaria 35 years from now, but it will be an urban malaria. It will be a different vector. It'll be uh, maybe an evolved parasite. Um, so um, doing it the way we've done it in the past won't work. The only way we will deal with malaria if we understand uh, the biological, um, the social, the cultural, um, the economic, and the political dimensions of it. You cannot address it with bed nets. You cannot address it with a drug. Um, it really has to do, it has to do with the very fabric of of society and life, and unless we think about it that way, which is inherently interdisciplinary, um, we'll have malaria in a slightly new form. Yep. Well, let me say that thank you very much. That was very well well said. But I thought that um, Party Center didn't do predictions. But we do try to take odds. <laughs> Well, I, I think the, it's very well stated. That malaria is such an incredibly complex disease that it has the ability to shift from the actual disease agent itself to the vector, to the habitat, urban to rural. It's the nature of the malleability of these kinds of, of problems that's, that's instructive <clears throat> and should lead us to be, be, to be conservative, um, um, humble, but then to approach a wide variety of things. The single solution, which is what tends to be the most saleable in the, in the public market, is not the point. And then malaria is just an example, but it's a good example. And maybe the mosquitoes learn from the fruit flies, as I heard <laughs> from our colleague here. But it's, the collective learning curve is incredible. But it is a, coll a collectivity that we're not quite used to respond to. We're looking for Vaccines, that's where all the, all the money is going. That's not going to be it. So, so the mosquito may not be smarter than us, but they'll try more strategies than we do. <laughs> no, way and they do it more quickly. <laughs> Very quickly. <laughs> Randy. Um, 
I think what the previous uh, speakers have tried to do is give a point estimate. And I, as an economist, would like to say, well, I think there's a 50 percent chance we will still be talking about it uh, 35 years from now. But I'm actually a little bit optimistic about that particular parasite. It's a multicellular organization that's multiplying in people's blood. Traditionally, those type of, of organizations are easier to develop vaccines for than some of the uh, viruses and other uh, problematic. And I do believe that there is now beginning to be a lot of research on the many different phases at which they might be able to attack the malaria um, parasite. And it might not be mosquitoes. I, I think that seems like the new direction going after it in other uh, forms. And so maybe we'll be lucky there, but there will be some new parasites that are coming along, probably mosquito-borne and others. And that's what we'll be talking about 35 years from now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That, that just means that, uh, As long as we are talking about something in 35 years, we'll be in business. Uh, but... <laughs> But, but I think we before you leave, uh, we, we've learned a lot. I just wanted to highlight a few things. I think we've learned not to have disease in the title. Yeah. We've learned not to have development in the title. Just we, <laughs> we, but future challenges, no one, no one, no one challenged. But, but more, more, I, I think that the conversation was all over the place, and maybe we should, in future, we'll also try to sort of focus it more. But I think being all over the place highlights the point we want to make. And it, to me, the point was one about linkages, multiple strategies, integration, no single solutions, and we have to learn from the past if we want to do better for the future. Thank you once again, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much for the panel, and uh, I hope to see you again in two weeks. <laughs>